everybody says, oh, you know, we're going to get you to a happiness by helping you increase your income. Ooh, let's, you know, do a multi-level marketing campaign or let's start a business and be an entrepreneur or whatever the fuck it is that they're trying to sell you. Um, you know, it's, happiness equals uh, more money or a, a big, bigger house or a better car or a better spouse or, you know, happier uh, kids, get your life in order, whatever it is, lose weight, yada, yada, yada. That's going to equal happiness. We, this level of thinking is the problem of today's world in that it's going to be the next thing that we get you. The next thing that we add to your life, the next thing that we add to your sense of self is going to be the thing that makes you happy forever. Well, that's bullshit. Hey, everybody. How you doing? Welcome to the Mind Hacking Happiness Podcast. This is episode two. I am your host, Sean Webb. I hope everything's going awesome for you today. So the Mind Hacking Happiness Podcast is dedicated to bringing you to the next level of your existence. In this second episode of the Mind Hacking Happiness Podcast, I am going to do a couple of things. One, I'm going to give you a 50,000 foot overview of how your mind works. And two, I'm gonna give you one of the best simple, quick tools that you can use to get your mind back into a place where you can have a better equilibrium about things. We're gonna help you get a better control of your mind so that you can start to unlock some of the stuff that you didn't even know was there for you. We're gonna give you the 50,000 foot view. We're gonna cover a lot of information today, but then we're gonna break this stuff down later. So you don't have to get 100% of this episode. Um, as long as you get the tool at the end, that's gonna be the really useful part for you. Um, that's gonna be an amazing tool for you. It's the favorite tool of everyone who's ever found any of my stuff on the internet at all. They're always like, oh my God, this thing is so useful. It's so cool. It's the thing that I use almost every day. So you're gonna get that at the end of this episode. So from there, I guess we'll just jump into it. Uh, we'll hit a little, a couple of commercials right up front just to let you know who's uh, supporting this podcast and how you can support the podcast because we're gonna rep a couple of products for you that we actually use here. We're never gonna rep any products that we don't actually use or believe in. So, uh, but just heads up, those are up front and uh, we'll get into it as soon as we get back. Three, two, one, go. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain. When you die on your deathbed, you will receive total consciousness. I'm not trying to sell you on this idea in the sense of converting you to it. I want you to play with it. I want you to think of its possibilities. I'm not trying to prove it. I'm just putting it forward as a possibility of life to think about. Welcome to Mind Packing Happiness. Calm the fuck down and take your seats. The only way to get rid of it is to accept it as it is right now. Some people say a science of consciousness is impossible. I think that we may need one or two ideas that initially seem crazy before we can come to grips with consciousness. Gunga, gunga, gunga. Hey, here's a great offer for you. I know that many of you have already checked out my Mind Hacking Happiness books, which are considered by some folks to be the best books on the human mind currently available, and I'm not gonna argue with those people because I did try to make them that good. And my Navy SEAL friends did confirm that what's in the Mind Hacking Happiness books is indeed better than what Special Operations Command and US Intelligence Service provides their active operators, so there's that. And so, for those of you who are on the bus of taking control of your mind to improve how your mind works, good for you. Glad to have you on board. But if you haven't checked out the Mind Hacking Happiness books yet, you can actually get a free copy of the audio versions of any of my books from Audible if you aren't already a member. And here's how that works. Just go to mindhackinghappiness.com slash free book. And that will take you directly to my affiliate link at Audible where you can sign up for the free trial and then they give you a free book just for trying them out. Now, I've been an Audible member since 2006, and I never have a problem spending all my credits, which wind up costing me about $11 a book on average, which is super cheap because you can get $50 books on Audible for one credit, and that's like 80% off in some cases. I wind up blowing through all my credits and getting more. I love these guys so much. I love having the author themselves read their own book, which I did also, by the way. So you can get my inflection and my emphasis of thought and or I love having the professional voice talent read the books with the character voices in some cases when it's a fiction book. I can listen while I'm at the gym or in the car or out for a walk, it's great. And so if you have interest in checking out one of the Mind Hacking Happiness books or any book really, I won't tell if you don't get my book, just go to mindhackinghappiness.com slash free book and give Audible a try. And if you don't like it, just cancel and they charge you nothing and then you get to keep the book. That's mindhackinghappiness.com slash 
free book. Check out Audible today. Hey guys, I wanted to take a moment to talk to you today about the Muse Meditation Headband, because frankly, I think this thing is way cool. I have one at home, and if you're wanting a great tool to help you along with your meditation training, you're gonna wanna check this out. It goes on your forehead like this and around your ears. This one is my older one, which is huge compared to the new slimline versions they're shipping today, which are much lower profile. You kind of wear it like a, a pair of headphones, except the strap goes across the front of your forehead instead of over the top of your head. They do that because the strap itself is filled with sensors that read your top layer brainwave activity from within your skull. It's non-invasive, doesn't hurt, connects to your mobile device via Bluetooth, and then sends your brainwaves in real time to your device so it can monitor your meditation live and give you immediate feedback so you can adjust your focus if you get off track. It provides immediate audio feedback that you can hear within the various soundscapes that you can choose from to meditate with. For instance, I like the beach noises where when I'm in deep meditation, the waves crashing on the beach calm down quite a bit and the flock of birds starts to gather nearby. And when I lose focus, I'm still at the beach, but now the birds have flown away and the waves are starting to crash a bit harder to let me know my focus isn't quite where it should be. The app tracks your sessions and your progress and sessions can be as short as three minutes or as long as you want. It's a really cool technology that you need to check out if you want to improve the effectiveness of your meditation sessions, which in turn improves your health your cognitive processing abilities, your stress levels, and ultimately how long you live thanks to the science of telomeres in your cells which protect your DNA and which get longer through engaging in meditation. Proven in studies, it's crazy. You can get a special discount on the Muse Meditation headband by going to my affiliate link at mindhackinghappiness.com slash muse. You won't even need a checkout code to get that discount. Do yourself a favor and check out the Muse Meditation headband today by going to mindhackinghappiness.com slash muse. Okay, so if you're interested in checking out the Muse headband or Audible, I highly recommend both. There you go. So let's get into the meat of today's episode. So this is episode two, and right up front here, I'm going to give you the 50,000 foot view of how your mind works and the places that you can go to change how your mind works. Because here's the simple fact of human development, especially with the mind. You cannot get your mind to do anything new without stopping what it normally does, period. And that's why this is really one of the only successful programs to get you to a point of mind development in the speed in which we're able to do so, because no one tries to stop what the mind is doing normally before starting to pile on more stuff to get the mind to do something different. And it only has a certain level of capacity to be able to process and do things, and breaking the habits of your mind is one of the most difficult things to do in life. It is not easy to do, uh, to break a habit of something psychological or something mental, where your mind just goes there over and over, and the reason that's true is because of this science called plasticity. Now, neuroscience is brand new, um, relatively speaking to other medicines and sciences. And one of the first things that it discovered in the last couple of decades is the fact that our brain changes in form and function over time based on how we use it. It used to be thought that people um, got a brain and gosh, let's roll the dice and see if we get a good one, come on seven. And that brain was the brain that you were stuck with for the rest of your life. Well, the reality is that that's not true. Just like when you go to the gym and you lift weights and your muscles get bigger, or if you stop and they get smaller and atrophy, um, your brain is the organ in your body that is most designed to change based on how you use it. And it will, within weeks, change in form and function, adding gray matter, adding white matter, atrophying the, the systems that are no longer in use anymore for you. Um, so, Changing what your mind is doing is the first step to get it to do something else. And so giving you that 50,000 foot view of how your mind works gives you that tool to be able to, to step in and say, okay, we're going to change this variable. We're going to change this variable here. We're going to change how we do things here. And then your mind works differently moving forward from that moment forward. That's why you know, this program is 
as successful as it is for as many people as it is. And so we're gonna give you the 50,000 foot view today of how your mind works so that you can get an idea of what's going on in there, so how you can change it and, and how you can change your life, et cetera. And then second part is at the very end, we're gonna give you the, one of the most useful tools that exists on being able to take control of your moment to moment existence and step away from any troubling turbulence that your mind might be creating at any given moment. And then you're gonna understand at least how and why the tool works as well as being, you know, having it in your tool bag to be able to pull out and say, oh wow, yeah, I forgot this is an awesome tool that will reset my mind and equilibrium at this moment of turbulence in my life and then gives you back control of your whole existence in that moment, it's really cool. All right, so <clears throat> hopefully I have hooked all this technical stuff up correctly to where we can switch back and forth to these visual aids that I put together for us to be able to understand what's going on with what I'm talking about. I always think that you know, adding a picture or a diagram or a little, you know, I love standing in front of a whiteboard and just talking and then drawing out what I'm trying to explain to people. Well, I did that with these um, keynote slides, so hopefully, we will be able to use this stuff to our advantage and give you something to look at rather than my smiling face or yakking face. Um, so why are we doing this right up front in episode two? Well, to give you the big picture so you might better understand how your human mind and the minds of others work so that you can um, navigate better around your own uh, previous limitations that you will no longer have moving forward and the limitations of other people that you will run into on a daily basis and you'll be able to see very clearly. Uh, as you move forward. Then uh, we want you to understand how all of your mind's inner bullshit works. So you can throw a wrench into that whole system. We want, on to, uh, want you to understand the path to higher happiness levels within your life without having to change any of your external conditions, by the way. Here's the thing. Everybody says, oh, you know, we're gonna get you to a happiness by helping you increase your income. Ooh, let's, you know, do a, a multi-level marketing campaign or let's start a business and be an entrepreneur or whatever the fuck it is that they're trying to sell you. Um, you know, it's happiness equals uh, more money or a, a big, bigger house or a better car or a better spouse or, you know, happier, uh, kids, get your life in order, whatever it is, lose weight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's going to equal happiness. We, this level of thinking is the problem of today's world in that it's going to be the next thing that we get to you, the next thing that we add to your life, the next thing that we add to your sense of self is gonna be the thing that makes you happy forever. Well, that's bullshit because happiness works uh, as a physiological response of your nervous system and your nervous system normalizes after a while. It's like, uh, we'll talk about this in um, in a few minutes, but you know, you walk into a room and you start smelling something, like you smell gas in your house or whatever, and then after 10 minutes, you don't smell it anymore. That's why you can't uh, smell your own body odor most of the time. It's why you, you know, when you're in a place and you start to smell gas, you need to get outside immediately because over about 10 minutes, your your nervous system normalizes and it won't report to you the things that haven't changed because what it is is a big comparator. It, it uh, reports the differences in things, right? Um, it'll only tell you if something's different than another thing. So when you go from point one to point two uh, or time one to time two with gas low to gas high, let's say you walk into a room and there's a gas leak, well, all of a sudden you smell the gas. Well, after a minute, gas... Uh, time uh, t two to time three, it's not going to report to you the difference in the gas level anymore. And you're going to be breathing that gas and, and on your way out uh, of uh, existence uh, because you didn't leave when your, your nose told you originally. Well, that same type of thing happens with happiness. It's called the hedonic uh, adaptation or the happiness treadmill, some like to call it, in that you get a new thing, you get more money, or you get a new car, you get whatever, and then that gets you happy for a little while. But then after a while, your nervous system normalizes to that new thing, and all of a sudden it doesn't make you happy anymore. Well, the reason that is, is that's the way your nervous system works. And so adding something, <clears throat> more money, bigger house, better cars, whatever the hell it is that they're trying to sell you, is not the path to happiness, because eventually your uh, nervous system is going to normalize to that new normal, and all of a sudden you're gonna be back to your baseline happiness levels. And so you can't continually try to set your life's external conditions to be better and better and better because ultimately 
there's going to be a point where your happiness is going to be limited by the amount that you can increase your whatever it is that you're trying to increase. Well, the truth of the matter is your happiness exists within you, right? Your happiness comes from your mind always. Even if you're setting an external condition and it makes you happy for a time, let's say you won the lottery, you get one year of happiness for that, by the way. Um, all of a sudden, um, you know, the happiness comes flooding from your mind. Well, that's where happiness comes from always. It always comes from your mind. If your mind is satisfied that you have set life's external conditions to the point that it's happy, then it gives you happiness and trickles it out from under the happiness door in your mind where the happiness storage room is behind that door and it, you need to go align all the stars in the universe and then we're going to give you some happiness. And then after a while, we're going to stop giving you happiness because now you got to go get new shit. Well, <clears throat> that's not how you should approach happiness because the fact is that you own that mind and you own that happiness in that happiness storage room and you can kick in that fucking door and go in and get all the happiness you want if you know how okay and so uh, we're gonna give you those tools to be able to understand how to take control of your mind how to kick in that happiness door and go in and get all the happiness you want without having to accept any of your external levels or, or your external conditions and then finally um, there's some really amazing stuff uh, that we want you to understand regarding the path to enlightenment, the path to higher levels of function from your mind. Um, there's some amazing stuff that your mind can start doing if you get it to stop doing what has been limiting you up till this point. So um, we are here at Mind Hacking Happiness, our little volunteer team, I, I say we a lot. Um, there's four or five of us working on this little project. We are going to be very um, irreverent in all of the stuff that we give you to improve your life and improve your, um, your mind development to the point that you can start doing some amazing stuff that you never thought you could do before. And we're going to do it unapologetically. You're no longer going to be one of those folks who is beholden or held hostage by somebody else trying to control your life or control what you do with your life based on how they manipulate your mind because you're going to be manipulating your mind from here forward. So we're gonna start this process by explaining to you um, some of your subconscious stuff that goes on in your mind. Why are we gonna do that? Why are we gonna start with this emotional processing and where your pain and suffering comes from, stuff like that? Because frankly, the vast majority of the BS that you have to deal with on a daily basis comes from your own mind, comes from your own reactions to stuff. It comes from your own negativity, your own internal processing, your own reactions to the things that exist around you or the thoughts that float through your mind that your imagination um, creates. Uh, a lot of that stuff that's been blocking you from being able to do the cool stuff that other people are able to do that you want to be able to do with your mind, well, that comes from a space of subconscious processing, including all of your emotional reactions to things. And so one of the big things that we need to get out of the way for you is the ability to take conscious control of your emotional reactions in real time. And so <clears throat> um, the basic operation of your entire mind, including all of its thoughts, emotions, and challenges, is derived from the basic operation of your nervous system. And why do we say that? Well, because your mind is mostly created by the gray matter of your brain and how it operates and your gray matter of your brain and your white matter is basically your nervous system in a very centralized form right you've got your nervous system all over your body but most of your nervous system is up here in your head and it works in a very specific way um, your nervous system is nothing but a big comparator it constantly compares one thing to another we talked about this just a minute ago where you put your hand on the stove and it's not telling you hey this is 160 degrees we need to move the hand cells are being destroyed life is being destroyed in the hand it tells you hey this is much hotter than it was a second ago okay it's never telling you an exact uh, measurement of something it's always telling you a comparative measurement from one moment to the next and that's why we're talking about when you smell a gas leak you need to get out of your house because your nose 
from time one to time two says gas low to high. Hey, wake up in the middle of the night. There's a gas leak, get out of the house. But then you walk around for a little bit, you think it was a dream because time two to time three, all of a sudden your nervous system normalizes, you go back to bed and everybody in the house dies. Well, that's because your nervous system is a big comparator. It's always comparing one thing to another. And if time two to time three doesn't have any change, the gas is high to gas is high, it's gonna stop telling you that there's a gas leak in the house when it told you the first time, dummy. So um, when we're talking about the nervous system, um, <clears throat> we're talking about a big comparator. Well, your nervous system also creates all your emotions, right? Creates sadness and anger and fear and worry, regret, etc. All of your emotional processing, it comes from your subconscious mind, comes because of this comparator system within your nervous system, right? This, this functionality within your nervous system. And so the two things that your nervous system creates, 100% of your emotional responses in your life come down to two, two variables. One is the expectation or preference about any certain something that's gonna be happening in the next few seconds. And then the other thing that it compares is your perception with an appraisal process about that same something. And this is the basic understanding of how your nervous system works, but it's also the basic understanding of how all of your human emotions work and all the pain and suffering that your mind creates to keep you out of happiness and to keep you from um, turning on the higher functions that your mind has. That's these two things being compared all the time, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, okay? <clears throat> now, this is called your equation of emotion. Your equation of emotion can be expressed thusly. Expectation and or preference as compared to your perception equals an emotional reaction, okay? Every emotion you have ever experienced in life and every emotion you will ever experience in life, in life is governed by this one simple equation. You can never, ever break it. In basics, it works like this. When your expectation or preference about any one thing matches your perception about any one thing, then you have a positive emotion about that perception connected with your expectation or preference about that thing. If your expectation or preference is different than your perception about any one thing, then you have a negative emotion about whatever it is that's passing through your mind at that moment or passing through your perception at that moment, okay? Let's get, look at a couple of examples. <clears throat> your expectation or preference is on a camping trip that maybe a bear doesn't enter your tent. And then all of a sudden, a perception of a bear entering your tent comes into your awareness. Well, you have a little bit of a freak out. Why do you have the freak out? Well, because your expectation and preference that your life be safe and in a safe situation where a bear's not there uh, is an imbalance when a bear actually starts to walk into your tent. And so your nervous system then says, hey, there's a big imbalance here. There's something not quite right here. There's something amiss. And the appropriate reaction for this situation is fear. And there's special rules about the individual emotions that we'll talk about later. You don't need to know that stuff right now. We're just talking about the 50,000 foot view that you need to understand the big tool at the end of this episode, which is gonna be awesome, by the way. <clears throat> so in the event that your expectation or preference does match your perception. Let's say you have a favorite team and you want them to win the big game and all of a sudden your perception is that they did win the big game. Then your emotional reaction is one of happiness or something on the positive scale, right? Um, and this is true for every individual thing that you will ever do in your life or every individual thought that you have. If you have an expectation or preference that that new tech gadget is gonna be awesome and you bring it home and it is awesome, then you have a positive emotion about that tech gadget. If you want it to be awesome and all of a sudden it sucks or it doesn't work coming out of the box or doesn't do what you thought it did, then you have a negative emotion about that thing and you wind up taking it back to the store. If your relationship is going well and your expectation of a preference about your relationship matches your perception about your relationship, you are happy about your relationship. If your expectation of preference about your relationship does not match your perception about your relationship, then you have negative emotional responses about that relationship. And it doesn't have to be the relationship en masse. It could be something like, oh, everything's awesome except, uh, uh, you know, she leaves the tooth cap toothpaste cap off the toothpaste or whatever it is, right? It could be one little thing and it's always the little things that pile up and the things that you're always perceiving that are horrible that then starts to taint the relationship in mass. Like, 
oh my God, he farts in his sleep or whatever it is, the one thing that doesn't match your expectation or preference and is compared to your perception, then those things are the ones that stick out in your mind to say, oh, this is this is the part of the relationship that sucks. Compared to, you know, if you brought your perception to the positive portions of the relationship, then it might last a bit longer than it does. <clears throat> now, the opposite is also true. When you test it for a negative proof, when you remove one or the other variables about your expectation or preference or your perception about any one thing, you will not have an emotional reaction about that thing, which is really cool. For instance, if you don't have a expectation or preference about a certain team winning the game, then when you find out they did or did not win the game, it doesn't matter to you. You didn't have an attachment to the team. Um, and if you don't have a perception, let's say you do care about someone who, uh, or a team that is playing a, a sporting event, and you don't know who won the game yet. Let's say you were busy or had something else to do and the game was played, you don't know the score yet, you don't have an emotional reaction about that game yet. Um, you could be, it could be driving you crazy that you want to know the score of the game. Sure, why not? Um, but that's an, a different expectation or preference that the expectation or preference that you wanted to know the score of the game and that you don't know the score of the game, those are imbalanced and that's driving you crazy. But the game itself, you don't know who won or lost because your perception isn't there yet. So you don't have an emotional reaction about who won or lost the game itself, which is basically how your nervous system works. So of course it works that way. <clears throat> now, where does the EP come from? Where does the expectation and or preference come from? This is where we back up just a little bit to give you a better understanding of how your mind works to give you that expectation or preference, okay? So your brain and mass is your organ of survival. Your heart is a different organ, your liver is a different organ, your kidneys are a different organ, your heart pumps the blood around your body, the liver takes the uh, impurities and uh, toxins out of your system, the kidneys purify the blood itself and um, helps you pee, et cetera. Your brain is an organ. Your brain is your organ of survival. Your memory helps you remember where the food and water is. Your cognition helps you figure out how to build shelter. Your imagination helps you practice mentally for future situations. Heck, even your uh, uh, sense of humor helps you say funny things to get people to jump into bed to propagate the species, right? So your brain is all about surviving from today into tomorrow. It always gives you things that are useful for your uh, continued survival. Now, within that brain, you have this thing called the limbic system. It is your more primitive brain. It scans your senses and thoughts for threats. It's the one that's always there saying, is this a threat? Is this a threat? Is this a threat? It's the thing that looks down on the ground and sees, oh, a coiled something or other. Is that a snake or is that a hose? Right? It makes you jump a little bit. Right? That's your limbic system in action looking for potential threats to you so that you can survive from today into tomorrow. Um, it initiates protective emotional responses. Like when you see that uh, hose on the ground, you think it's a snake and you jump, that's a fear response. It's a, a, a nervous twitch response. And, and our emotions urge us towards uh, safety and defense. And when the limbic system fires, it shuts off your thinking brain. Your prefrontal cortex is your thinking brain. When your limbic system starts firing, your prefrontal cortex is shut down, and this is a protective system that says, we don't need to think about how fast we need to run when we see a snake in the grass, so we're gonna turn this off, expend our natural resources, our energy resources for the things that we really need, which are muscles in our legs to run or our, our muscles in our arms to fight. We don't need to think about how to get away from that snake to be able to get away from it. This is a survival mechanism. But the problem is, in the last 150 years, we went from being able to run from the snake to get away from danger, to now a lot of our problems and a lot of our emotional issues are arising in situations where we need to be able to think to get out of them. So it's worse that our limbic system shuts off our thinking brain because then that just prolongs our suffering, prolongs our uh, problem of being able to get out of our limbic response, well, we're going to help you fix that, okay? <clears throat> now, in this whole process of scanning for threats, where you walk around every day, every moment of every day, your limbic system is scanning, oh, is this car going to hit me? Oh, is this person a threat over here? Oh, what does that headline mean to me, right? Um, there is uh, something else that's missing in that equation. 
when your brain is your organ of survival, your, limb, your limbic system is scanning for threats, another question must be asked. Well, a threat to what exactly? What is it that I'm supposed to be protecting if I'm the limbic system, right? What is the, the laundry list of things that I need to be protecting? I need to understand who I am and what I am to understand what's gonna be a threat to me, right? And so this is where we've created our mind's self or our mind has created a self for us to defend. This is the critical definition of all that is you that must be protected from all threats. It's a physiological requirement for survival. Now the function of the self and the brain itself is found in multiple areas. Basically your mind's self is the list of stuff that your mind believes makes you, you. It is inclusive of your body, which is why you automatically dodge when a baseball or something comes flying at your head and you duck, that's your limbic system in, re in action, in, in protecting you from a potential threat, right? It's why we jump when that big clap of thunder comes. It's that place of, I need to potentially move to get out of here if something big is about to fall on me with a big noise coming from behind me, right? That's the whole limbic system in action. But um, your body, is hardwired into that system, but your body isn't the only thing that gets wired into yourself that must need protecting. The brain also maps onto the self the things that are familiar to you in your life. Now this starts with a <clears throat> Jim Cohn study from UVA who really opened up the world of psychology and understanding our subconscious processes through this uh, potential, or through this whole uh, string of studies. But basically what he did is he started with a group of folks who put him in an fMRI machine and he was going to basically give him a zap of electricity on their ankle and he's gonna measure the fear in their response. And he wanted to test originally what holding hands might do to the brain's response of um, a threat to self. And so what he did is he put the glasses on the person, he gave him a flash of light, he waited to watch the brain in that instance after he gave him a flash of light, and then he administered a, a zap to the ankle of the people who were in the fMRI machine. So what they got was what they expected to get, flash of light, pause to watch the brain, the brain reacted in fear. Holy shit, here comes the zap on my ankle. Right, And so they were able to identify the fear center of the brain. They were able to identify and map the this portion of the brain that connected with self, you know, a threat to self is an ankle zap is what that is. And so the brain reacts accordingly. Well, then they did a second run and they said, okay, well, now we're going to bring this, this stranger in and we're going to put the ankle zapper on the uh, stranger. And we're going to give you the flash of light. We're going to watch your brain, but they're going to zap the stranger. So what they did, gave him the flash of light, watched the brain in reaction, and they got ex exactly what they expected there as well. No fear, right? Because there's no potential threat to self. They thought self was just the body at that moment. So yeah, they're not, you're not going to zap the, your body. You're going to zap somebody else's body. So no fear should be the result. No fear was the result. Now, they did an interesting third portion of that experiment, which is what opened up everything um, for the understanding of how the human mind worked, the mind self, et cetera, which is they brought a third person in who is a familiar to the person in the fMRI machine, a good friend, a loved one, a family member, whatever it was, is what science calls a familiar. So they gave him the, the zap, or excuse me, they gave him the flash of light in the glasses, they paused to watch the subject's brain, and then they zapped the loved one. and what they got they didn't expect from the results of the study because what they got was an exact reading of the first run that they did when they were zapping the person's own body they got the exact same readings from the people in the fmri when you're zapping somebody who is a loved one who is familiar to you so this showed a couple of things one that it wasn't just the body that it gets a fear reaction or emotional reactions based to potential threats to self. But if there was someone else that was a familiar to you, you had emotional reaction to that person as well. But then they also were mapped onto the same exact areas of the brain that were that, that defined your mind self. There was no difference between the brain scans. They couldn't tell them apart. And so what Jim Cohn pr proved was that <clears throat> other people can become mapped onto your mind's sense of self and thus be on the laundry list of things that must be protected for you to, um, you know, for your brain to work its charter, which is to survive from one moment into the next or survive your definition of self from today into tomorrow. Well, that now simply includes people. 
who are other than you as well. Now, the interesting thing that happened there <clears throat> is that another business school student, Tiffany, or business school professor, excuse me, Tiffany Burnett White at UIUC, then proved that self brand connection, SBC, also plays into that same um, function and also connects with the same areas of the brain that define our body self and our other people around us self in that we can get attached to brands such as Apple Android, such as uh, San Francisco 49ers versus Dallas Cowboys, such as whatever your favorite brand of whatever is. When a bad news about that brand comes to you, you react in the same way as having a personal uh, attack or personal loss. So she showed that other ideas can become attached to your sense of self and thus drive emotional reactions based on the same one equation of emotion that we talked about previously. Your expectation or preference about something versus your perception about something. Well, now if you love Apple and all of a sudden uh, the newest Apple product sucks or somebody's saying something in the news about Apple or you have some bad news about Apple or whatever, that perception is gonna be created in your mind. That's gonna be an imbalance and you're gonna have a negative emotion about that Apple thing in your mind or your Dallas Cowboys thing in your mind is gonna be creating a negative reaction from the same basic function of your nervous system, the same basic function that creates emotions about your body and you and the people you love can also create emotional reactions about the things that you prefer including Sam Harris did a few studies on politics and religion, and you don't even have to go very much farther than Facebook to see the emotional reactions that people have about their politics or their religion or defending one of those uh, in an argument, right? Emotional reactions are, of course, associated with politics and religion and the things that you connect to mentally that then drive your mind into a tizzy, when something doesn't match your expectation or preference about that one thing, okay? Um, other ideas of self can be attached to your mind's um, definition of you, which includes you know, your cultural heritage, your career or job, or whatever you do for a living, uh, the things that you've done in life, your accomplishments, uh, your scarring memories in life can become a potential uh, existence or definition of who you are, if you put those things on as a piece of identity, right? Uh, all of those things can become a portion of your sense of self, which then creates an expectation or preference about that self thing um, that you then must defend. And so your mind's idea of you can get all muddled up and clouded up with all of these various things that you get attached to in your life. And that creates another instance of potential unrest or imbalance in your mind's existence with the more things that fall onto your self map that you identify as being a portion of your life, right? And of course, the more stuff that winds up on your self map, the more things are that can ruin your day. Well, <clears throat> this is where the expectation of preference comes from in your mind for your equation of emotion. Every one of those individual things has an expectation or preference automatically assigned to it. You know, and the rule comes from homeostasis. Everything on the self map must be held at status quo or increased in value, or we're going to have a problem. So in your body, you know, I am my body, the baseball comes flying at your head. That is a perception that your body may take a devaluation or may take an injury if you don't duck. And so almost involuntarily, you duck out of the way of the baseball that's flying at your head because your equation of motion was your expectation or preference be that your body be held at status quo or increase in value, and there's a potential baseball that could be uh, about to conflict with that. And so you take action, the emotional reaction is the involuntary reaction of the startle reflex and the, and the, um, the motions of the muscles to move your head out of the way to bring a uh, balance to your equation of emotion. Well, that stuff occurs as well on every individual thing that is a part of your self map down to the things that you get attached to in the moment. A project at work, right? You're working on a project at work and all of a sudden you have an expectation or preference that the project at work go well or that you be seen as a, a good project deer or whatever the hell it is. And then all of a sudden a perception comes in that's either good or bad about that thing and all of a sudden you have an emotional reaction about that project at work. And it is either making or ruining your day at that point. Seems a little silly to me, but that's how the human mind is wired. It's how it's been working for the last uh, you know, number of thousands of years. 
Um, but it doesn't have to be how it works. It doesn't have to be how your mind is filled. You can actually turn that stuff down and turn it off to a certain extent to where you don't sweat the small stuff and everything's small stuff, right? That uh, famous book. <clears throat> so now, um, that's where your expectation or preference comes from is all the individual things on your self map automatically get an EP applied to them. It's not a selected thing. It's not a conscious thing where you say, this is my expectation or preference. The expectation or preference comes from the stuff on your self map. Okay. It's automatically assigned. Everything that winds up on your self map, the, anything that's associated with you, like this is one of my favorite coffee mugs in the world. If I broke this thing, I would be disappointed. Why? Because it's on my self map as my favorite coffee mug. And if it takes a devaluation, such as being broken into pieces, I will have the emotional reaction associated with this one coffee mug. Based on my simple equation of emotion being expectation or preference is that it take no harm or be increased in value, and then it gets broken, and there's my disappointment, right? Okay, so that's how it works. That's where your EP comes from with everything that is associated with you. All your stuff, all your people, all your ideas, all your opinions, all your, uh, you know, religion, emotion, yada, yada, yada. That's how your mind works and how it creates your emotions. Now, there's some really cool neuroscience that you just knowing that one thing is going to change your life for the rest of, rest of your life, which is really cool. I'll explain that shortly. But let's get back to the other side of the equation of emotion for a moment. The other side of the equation of emotion is your perception, right? It's the things that are passing through your mind with an appraisal process of whether that thing is good or bad, right? Um, it is how you see things that happen around you in the world that creates one half of 100% of your reactions to everything that you perceive in life. And so let's take an instance of an example where your expectation or preference of value, uh, your whole existence, is that it be held harmless and someone cuts you off in traffic. You can have three different perceptions, probably more than that, but we're gonna talk about three. You can have three different perceptions about someone cutting you off in traffic. Now, if you see it as disrespectful to you, then you see that as a potential devaluation to you or an attack on you. And so one of the definitions of anger is that you, it's the reaction that you have when you perceive a devaluation that you wanna reject or that you wanna fight against. And so that's where anger comes from, is someone's about to pee on you and you say, no, 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 no. We're not gonna have that, right? And so if you see that someone cutting you off in traffic is disrespectful, like they're saying, where I'm going is more important than where you're going. Uh, your existence doesn't matter in my decision to take your lane you know, that type of thing, then you're going to get angry. You're going to say, hey, screw you, pal. You're going to get on the horn. You're going to flip the bird. You're going to do whatever you, you want to do to help uh, defend your uh, level of pride or your level of existence and your value, your self-value, basically your expectation and preference that your value not be decreased <clears throat> at all. You're going to fight against that decrease in value. And if you see someone cutting you off traffic, that's a devaluation of you. So you're going to get the anger response, right? However. If you see someone who's cutting you off in traffic as an accident, maybe they're just not paying attention or whatever, then you're more just on the surprise track. You're just more on the innocent uh, response associated with, oops, holy shit, here comes somebody into my lane, right? And so that's going to change. Your perception is going to change 100% your emotional response to that same instance, the same instance of you being potentially um, brought into danger and someone else moving into your lane by doing so, right? Um, that's going to change your emotional outlook based on how you perceive it. Or a third situation. Let's say you realize that maybe that person has a real need to cut you off and to get into your lane so as to make it through traffic faster to get to the hospital to see someone who has fallen gravely ill unexpectedly or, you know, maybe there's an emergency that this person has and all of a sudden you're in a compassionate perspective you're in a holy crap yeah take my lane i'm i don't you know i got an extra 10 minutes i don't need to you know worry about uh you know being ahead of you or whatever it is right your perception changes your emotional reaction 100 percent from here the cool thing is that you can do two things you can ask yourself two questions for the rest of your life regarding every emotional reaction that you've had because the Nervous system simply works the way it works. It's a simple comparator. It's always comparing two things. And you can always ask yourself, what was my expectation or preference regarding this situation or regarding whatever it was that is in jeopardy? And what was my perception of the event that caused the emotion to occur? The reason this is important for you to be able to do 
And this isn't the, the cool little trick, by the way. Uh, and we'll talk about this again later, so you don't have to get it now. But basically, one of the things that is hardwired into your brain is your limbic system sends messages up to your prefrontal cortex, your medial prefrontal cortex, your right ventral lateral prefrontal cortex to say, hey, is that a coiled hose on the ground or is that a snake? I'm having an emotional reaction here. We need to put an understanding to what's going on here because this could be a threat to our potential self. So we need to understand what's going on here. And when we understand it, then I'll stop sending you the message about the, the fear. I'll stop sending you the message about the anger, about this worry or regret or sadness or whatever it is, the stress level. When we understand this, when we understand what's going on here, when you, the thinking brain, tells me what's going on is cool, I will stop sending you that message. So what this little tool right here does changes your life. Because when you can understand your expectation or preference and your perception about the two things that have come together to create whatever emotional response that you're having, that puts that medial prefrontal cortex and the right ventral lateral prefrontal cortex into a, a mode of understanding, the emotional reaction, sends a message back to your limbic system, and the limbic system shuts off. They saw it real time in fMRI studies to where they put, uh, it's called this name it, tame it, the birth, a whole group of studies that were copycat studies around the world. They confirmed the um, results of this stuff to where you put a cognitive understanding to your emotional processing. Your emotional processing turns off in real time. They saw it happening as the fMRI was firing. The deregulation, the downregulation of the limbic system turned off the negative bullshit in the brain by understanding it. So the thing that you're doing with saying, what is it that's in my mind that is causing my emotional turbulence at this moment? What's the perception? What's the trigger? And what was the expectation that I had about this moment or this thing? That puts an understanding. That is the place where you can take your mind, turn it back in on itself, and change what your mind is doing. Well, at the point that you understand the two variables that come together to create any instance of emotional reaction that you have, then you can take what your mind is doing and change what your mind is doing. And it dumps you into this place called meta-awareness. Okay? Now, meta-awareness is that place where you can take your mind and turn it back in on the mind to find out what the mind is doing. Like when you have a daydream, you're daydreaming about Brad Pitt coming over in the Ferrari to pick you up, take you out for an afternoon drive or whatever it is. And then all of a sudden you realize, oh shit, I'm daydreaming and I need to get back to whatever I was doing, working or watching my television program, whatever it was. And that's the moment of meta-awareness. You have this, you use it every day where you're like, you get to the stop sign, you turn right, you're like, oh shit, I'm going to the post office. I needed to turn left. Then you turn around and go the other way. That's that moment of meta-awareness where you're actually taking your mind, looking back in on what your mind is doing and changing what your mind is doing. I call that the mind's control room. And if you understand what's going on with your mind, then it automatically turns off and downregulates your negative emotion. Okay? So let's see what this slide has for us here because it's got a whole bunch of animations in there. It's going to take us a long time to put together. Yeah. And basically this slide just explains what I had just explained to you. Total waste of time. So sorry about that. But here's the cool stuff about meta-awareness that studies have shown that when we use our meta-awareness and we uh, increase our meta-awareness practice through disciplines, because you can do this through meta-awareness um, training, such as meditation. Meditation is a meta-awareness training where you sit and you try to focus on one thing and you watch your mind trying to distract you. That's a meta-awareness thing. You're taking your mind and looking back in on what your mind is doing. Right. Well, these are all the benefits that come from that kind of stuff. Increased memory, boosted immune system, increased DNA telomeres. And this is what I was talking about previously, where, <clears throat> or maybe I was, where your telomeres are these things on the end of your DNA that will protect your DNA every time your cell replicates. And the telomeres are designed to fray off at the ends. Well, as soon as the telomeres are gone, your DNA starts fraying off at the ends, and then you get sick and die. Well, the longer your telomeres are, the longer you live. Stanford proved that study uh, through numerous studies, proved that science that says, yeah, <laughs> people that have longer telomeres live longer because their DNA doesn't fray away. Well, you can increase the level of your telomeres, the length of your telomeres, by increasing your uh, disciplines of meta-awareness, your meditation, your 
being able to turn off your emotional processing quicker by using your equation of emotion review, right? Your physical health gets better, your emotional regulation gets better, your focus, your alertness, your enhanced sensing processing, all this cool stuff happens in your brain that makes you a better human being and a more effective uh, brain. Uh, and then the other stuff, the bad stuff goes down. Mind wandering, distractions, chronic pain, depression, anxiety, cortisol levels, emotional interference, negative mood states, all that stuff decreases. OCD, PTSD, social phobias, eating disorders, all that stuff gets better when you improve your game in meta-awareness, okay? So that's important stuff for you to be able to take control of. And understanding your equation of emotion, being able to point at the two things that your brain has put together to say it's creating a negative emotion for me because of these two things helps that, helps that. So there's a kind of cool tool that we'll talk about a little more later. Now, is this all regarding your emotional reactions? Is this equation of emotion, is it all that simple? Yes, because you will never be able to break it. But no, it is also not completely that simple because how do we explain dozens of emotions within our mind? How do we explain variations in severity of emotions? And how do we explain complex emotions that we have? Well, we do have answers to all of those things. Um, and they are explained in depth in my red book, Mind Hacking Happiness, Volume one, the quickest way to happiness and controlling your mind. But this is a 50,000 foot view to get you to the awesome tool at the end of this episode. So we're not gonna provide all those here. Uh, to give you just a, a, a quick glance at them though, um, with just a few rules of applying over the top of the equation of emotion, um, you can start to understand the conditions that can uh, affect your different emotion groups, such as fear. Well, fear is when your perception is that your uh, sense of self is in real danger and there could be nothing that you could do about it. So that's fear. Anger is the definition that there is a potential devaluation of a self item, whatever it is, that you want to defend against. Okay? Sadness is you've actually taken a real loss where you've actually your perception is that you've actually lost something on your self map or something on your self map has taken a real devaluation. Okay. Uh, worry, regret, worry is a sadness or a fear that uh, has a future resolution. Regret is a sadness that has a past resolution that you're still hanging on to. Um, happiness is where the equation of emotion is balanced, right? And so you have all of these um, rules that help decide which emotion group is going to present for you from your subconscious processing. But then the other thing that happens is you have emotion severity. So within the fear group, for instance, you have um, concerned at a low level, up through cautious, up through afraid, up through terrified, and then finally your high level of emotion on fear is panic. And the same is true for every other emotion group. You have down at the low level of anger, you have annoyed. And then up above that, you have frustrated, angry, hate, rage, et cetera, depending on the power level of the severity of the emotion in the group that's being presented to you. Now, we'll get to this stuff later. You don't have to remember, memorize it all now. You don't have to understand it all now. We'll dig into this a little later so you can understand the intricacies of what's going on in your mind so you can be able to take control of it and shut it down, et cetera, throw a wrench into the whole works. Don't worry about having to know what this stuff is. Uh, but that explains how different emotion groups can exist with the one simple equation of emotion, the one simple function of your nervous system within your brain, creating all your emotional responses for you. And we'll be able to break that uh, for you to where you can experience the positive stuff and totally bypass the negative stuff in the future. But that's basically how it works. Now, how mixed emotions work are different. <clears throat> mixed emotions work through different equations of some emotion playing out simultaneously. All right, let's see if we have a slide for that. Nope. So the example for this is, um, let's say you have a, an expectation or preference about your favorite sports team. And you want them to win the championship. So you have an expectation or pre preference that you want them to win the championship. And then you also have an expectation or preference about that game, that it'd be a good game. You want it to be entertaining. You don't want it to be a blowout, et cetera. Let's say they do win the championship but they do so in a blowout fashion where it was over in the first quarter, the first portion of the game. It was just totally gone. 
well, you have a mixed emotion scenario there. You have a, yay, my team won the game, but, oh, man, it sucked that it was a blowout and I wasn't really interested after the first quarter uh, because um, your two equations of emotion are playing simultaneously. One is that your expectation or preference that your team win the game won the game. Your perception is what they won the game. That's the happiness. But then the perception um, comes in that the, it was a blowout when your expectation was there would be a closer game. Well, that's a disappointment because there's an imbalance there. And you've actually taken the hit. The score of the game is what it is. So the devaluation to this has occurred. So it's a disappointment, right? It's a low-level sadness. So your happiness is mixed with the low-level sadness that, well, you know, the game could have given, could have been better, et cetera. So that's how um, very complex emotions get built up is that, you know, dozens of equations of emotion can be playing out in a very complex emotional situation that give you a mixed emotion response based on the individual things that could land on your self-map and the individual perceptions that you could have in any one event or any one instance. So again, we'll talk about that stuff in later, uh, greater detail later. But um, the cool thing about this, it's universal. It doesn't work in just your mind, it works in everybody's mind. So now you can start to see inside other people's minds, other sides, other people's emotional reactions to understand a number of things. One, how to increase your empathy because you now understand exactly how somebody can feel a way that they're feeling about something because you understand it not just from a cognitive processing perspective, but from an emotional processing perspective. You can increase your, your compassion because now you can add the I want to help you component, which is the only difference between empathy and compassion. Empathy is that thing where you can feel somebody's pain. I feel your pain. Or you can then add the component of I want to help you. Well, that's the only difference between empathy and compassion is that motivational thing of I not only feel your pain, I want to help you out of your pain. Right? So now you can increase your empathy game. You can increase your compassion game by looking into other people's minds. Um, but uh, you can also then... Um, understand how to tread lightly up around somebody who might be a little difficult at times. And we'll look into that stuff in future episodes of this podcast as well, so don't worry about that. We'll dig into this stuff deeper. We're just giving you the 50,000-foot view today. So, <clears throat> now, here's the cool thing about being able to look into your mind and understand that you can look into your mind. Because... The basics of separation dictate that you have to have two different entities to be able to look from one thing to another. Because just as a tooth cannot bite itself, an eye cannot see itself, an olfactory nerve can't smell itself, a mind cannot watch itself. And this is the cool thing about you that you're learning right at this moment, is that the, at the instance that you can look in to your mind and see what's going on, you can look into your emotional process and see what's going on, you realize that you aren't that emotional process, that you aren't that mind. This is the point that you go from, I am my mind, to I am a being that has a mind. This is the moment that you go from, I am my emotional responses, to I am a being that has emotional responses. And if you didn't go, oh my fucking God, at that moment, please check your pulse, because this is one of the great instances of epiphany that everyone in the world comes to at some point, or they don't. If they do, their life gets better. If they don't, their life sucks, or they're out of control for the rest of their life, and let's hope they get lucky on the external conditions making them happy all the time, because otherwise, they're never going to understand that they aren't part of the soup. They aren't part of the process of their mind that creates their mind's reactions. The people who are stuck in that space are a victim of what their mind gives them for their entire lives, and their mind dictates how good their life is 100%. You don't have to exist in that space. No one has to exist in that space. Your mind is a process of the physiology that you have. And the proof that we are not completely our mind rests in the fact that we can look at our mind. We have an awareness that can look back into our mind. And just like a fingertip can't touch itself, Right? A mind can't see itself. There has to be a separation between the observer and the observed. And so at the point that you can understand your mind and see your mind and understand its processes and see it working, you realize that you are not your mind from a conscious point of view. Right? So you can kind of believe it a little bit. You can kind of buy into it a little bit, right? <clears throat> so your mind and its activity is actually what I call your me right? Your mind is your expectation or preference, 
compared to your perception equals your equation of emotion, emotional responses. You have your self map over there. You have your perception that goes into that. Um, this is your mind's me. This is your mind telling you the thing that it thinks you need to do to survive into tomorrow, giving your emotional reactions to you to help drive you into action. But you are the conscious awareness that exists beyond that. And at the point you realize that, that gives you a lot of freedom to be separated from your mind's reactions and your mind's emotional responses that don't necessarily have to ruin your day anymore. Because you are not the thing that's causing the turbulence. You are not part of the turbulence. You are not part of the, the existence that your mind is creating at that moment. You are the thing beyond. Now, there's not a whole lot going on in the beyond, that your awareness is always filled with your, what your mind's doing, so you do wind up thinking that you are your mind, but at the point that you can separate that, the point that you can understand that you're not your mind, that's the point of taking a huge step towards liberation and you deciding how your life works, regardless of what your mind is giving you. That's huge. That is the hugest thing you will ever learn in your entire life. It's the, the greatest lesson you can ever give yourself is to find that place where you're not quite your mind. You can actually look into your mind, see your mind, etc. okay? Now, the rule for this tool, because I'm about to give you the tool. I just ran into these slides accidentally. I didn't realize we were at that point in this conversation. Here is the cool tool that I promised you at the beginning of this episode. Um, the tool is called The Me. And the tool works like this. The rule for the me. Anytime you use the word me, put the word the in front of it. And so instead of saying, that makes me angry, say, that makes the me angry. Don't tell me what to do becomes, don't tell the me what to do. Or he, she broke up with me. He, she broke up with the me. Now, saying it this way, beyond being grammatically incorrect, which is one of its magical awesomenesses, um, because it just doesn't sound right and brings your attention to it, uh, it creates a separation between your mind's reaction and the awareness within yourself that is watching your mind or is experiencing your mind's reaction and reminds you that you aren't the mind's reaction itself. And you can feel it when you actually say, the me. So when your mind has a reaction and you say the me is is whatever is angry or the me is sad or the me is whatever it is that your mind is giving you the reaction it reminds you that you are not your mind and you aren't the bs that your mind is creating at that point and so that gives you a little bit of a thick black curtain a thick black curtain that comes down between you and the reaction of your mind to where you remind yourself i am not that that is what the mind's giving me at the moment but i don't necessarily have to be consumed by it i don't necessarily have to react to it and an extension of this is anytime you use the word i because sometimes we use the word i when we should be using the word me so anytime you use the word i use the words the me you know i'm upset about that the me is upset about that i don't like my boss the me doesn't like my boss i wish this or that or whatever it was was different the me wishes that were different, okay? It is the reminder, not in just a, a mind trick way, but in an actual realization way of, oh yeah, I'm able to see my mind, I'm able, I'm able to see the variables in my mind that came together to create my turbulence, to create my pain and suffering in this moment. So by default, I cannot be my mind. If I can look at my mind, fingertip can't touch itself, tooth can't bite itself, Eyeball can't look at itself, needs a mirror, needs some kind of distance. The fact that I can look at my mind, that means there's some kind of distance between the awareness of me and the me itself doing its thing, which is my mind, which is the process of the flesh, the meat suit that's trying to protect me. I don't necessarily have to buy into what it's giving me because it could be mistaken, it could be m misprocessing something. You know, it's, it's simply trying to protect the laundry list of things that it sees on its mind's self map and a perception that may or may not be correct uh, associated with that thing 
and this is the output it's, that it's giving me, but it's the me. It's not really what, who and what I am within my existence or in this awareness. It is a separate process that's not quite who and what I am. It is a part of my consciousness, certainly, but it's not me, it's the me. And that one little reminder right there can bring that thick black curtain down in between an emotional response that you're having that could be destructive and give you a little bit of space to breathe. Give you a little bit of space to remind yourself, I'm not this that's happening. I'm the thing that's beyond that a little bit. And I don't necessarily have to buy into that 100%. And it gives you back control of your mind. And if you can look at the variables that then created the emotional reaction in the first place, that fires the right ventral lateral prefrontal cortex and medial prefrontal cortex to shut down your limbic system. And then all of a sudden, the negative stuff that's coming up from your me gets turned off. Physiologically, seeing it on fMRI, right? So this little tool, at any point that somebody cuts you off in traffic, well, that really pissed the me off, <laughs> right? All of a sudden, you, you're step backing from it. You're stepping back from it a little bit. You're giving yourself a little bit of distance between you and the reaction, and all of a sudden, it's not controlling you as much anymore. All of a sudden, you have control over what's going on within you better than you did a half second ago when you objectify the thing that is creating your pain and suffering. And you say, oh, that's not, that's not really me. That's the me, right? And that's a huge, huge difference. And it makes a huge difference in people's lives when you actually use it and take control of your mind in that way because you don't have to be control of your, controlled by your mind. You can actually take control of your mind. Now, the cool thing about, let me just jump to this slide right here. The cool thing about a meta-awareness practice is that when using a tool like the me and you see that you are not the process of your mind, but that you have a process of your mind, but that you're not it, but that you can use it, it's a tool, you can deal with it, or you can shut it down when it gives you problem results. Um, that helps your subconscious that's in charge of writing your mind's self map, like all the things, the process in your mind that creates, oh, this person's a part of my world now or this idea is a part of my world now, it must be defended, or this new thing that I just got is a part of my world now, it must be defended, right? There's a portion of your subconscious that's in charge of keeping your self list up to date because it's very important that your self be completely accurate regarding um, your laundry list of items that must be protected because if you miscalculate, on one of those things, it could cost you your life. If you don't have a strict definition of who and what you are in your mind's eye, then the threats that come from the outside world could kill you if you don't have that definition be accurate. Well, there's a level of subconscious that's in charge of keeping that list accurate. But when you show it, when you show that level of subconscious that you are no longer just the mind and that you can see the mind, all of a sudden, that level of your subconscious in your mind has to rewrite yourself, has to rewrite your mind's self map. It says, wait a second, I thought I was the emotional BS. I thought I was my mind's reactions. I thought I was because I was, you know, this thing is flooding my consciousness all the time, this mind thing. I thought I was the mind, but now I'm the mind and the awareness that can look back in on the mind. Well, now I have to rewrite the definition of self to include that awareness. And all of a sudden, your mind's self grows a little bit. You get bigger. Now, there's some really cool things that occur because your self gets a little bigger in this moment. And one of those things is that your life's problems don't get any bigger, but your self gets bigger. And so if you have a, if you have a self map of, let's say, a small mud puddle or whatever, and you have some boats in it, which are the things on your self map, and they're floating in there, and you throw a life-size problem rock in there, it's going to splash some water out. It's going to make you feel a little smaller than you were a moment ago. It's going to rock your boats, maybe even sink one with the big waves of the big rock. But all of a sudden, if your mind realizes that you're not just your mind, but your mind and the awareness, all of a sudden, your mud puddle now goes out to, a, what, a small pond or something. So now you throw the same life-size rock, 
into the small pond, well, it might make some waves or whatever. The boats might rock a little bit, which is the stuff on your self-map, the portions of your life, like, you know, maybe a, a major event rocks your marriage a little bit or rocks your relationship with somebody a little bit or something like that. Well, now the boats aren't sinking. And the more and more you expand that self out, all of a sudden, your self of mud puddle because becomes a self of a pond, becomes a self of a lake, becomes a self of an ocean, becomes a self of infinity, and all of a sudden that life-size problem rock doesn't even register anymore. It doesn't even hold sway on you. Because you can do this awareness thing out a number of layers, where you can be aware of your mind, but then you can be aware of the awareness of your mind. And that makes the subconsciousness of your mind expand yourself out even a little bit farther. And this is what happens with meditative experiences. This is what happens with the world's contemplative disciplines of being able to expand mind, expand consciousness. This is what happens with psychedelics, where your mind becomes conscious of being more than what it was. That expansion makes yourself larger than what you thought you were previously, and thus your life's problems are less impactful because of that increased sense of that larger, that expanded sense of self that you're not adding individual items to, but just the whole area becomes larger. And the individual points on that map, by the way, then become less significant because they are less of a portion of your sense of self as it expands outward. So a whole bunch of cool things are happening for you in that moment. And you can do this a multiple to multiple levels again, like I said. Your meta-awareness practice can increase to be an awareness of the awareness of the awareness. You can take this out six or seven levels, and at the point that your mind starts to become completely silent, your sense of self expands outward to the point where your mind is so far away that its noise doesn't even register anymore. That's the point that your mind can start doing different things, that your brain can start doing different things, because it's compartmentalized a whole big section of what used to be your entire life now is this big. And now that noise doesn't matter as much anymore. And now your brain is starting to do different things based on how you're using it. And now we're talking about physiology stepping back in and the plasticity of your brain doing different things and helping you to change and do different things over time, just like you... Um, you get better at basketball with practice, you get better with p playing piano with practice, right? Your brain changes based on how and what you're doing with your, your mind to help you attain those things. Well, if you're increasing heightened levels of consciousness and heightened levels of happiness and decreased levels of pain and suffering, your brain changes to help you do that on a more effortless basis. And you become that existence. You become that no pain and suffering person. You become that heightened uh, happiness all the time person. You become that consciously aware person all the time because your brain changes to help you get there. Now this little tool of the me helps you do it that we gave you just a few minutes ago. It says when you have an emotional response, um, you can do uh, a couple of things to turn that down and to realize that you're not that emotional response and put some distance between you and that emotional response and reduce the pain and suffering that exists because of that emotional response. That's a tool that you can use immediately. Um, and now the cool thing about what you can do with your mind after you take care of all of the, um, uh, the regular instances of uh, pain and suffering that exists, right? Your mind does this, this thing for a while, for a long time, for all your life, and then all of a sudden you learn something new, and you learn that you're bigger than what you thought you were, and all of a sudden your brain patterns start to change, and your old patterns of existence cease, well, some new patterns can start to arise, and your brain can start to do new things, and you can start to gain access to levels of subconscious that you didn't know you had access to before. And by the way, that's where all of our super genius is held, is in the subconscious levels of our mind. We're actually the stupid one up, up, up on top that can handle the least amount of information. The deeper we go down into our subconscious, the more information we can handle and process, the smarter we are. Um, a study that proved that was a really cool study on um, giving people a problem about, <clears throat> it was a judgment problem on how to organize cars or something like that into classifications. 
And then um, they let you think about that through the whole time. They watch your brain, and then they, yeah, they asked you for an answer at the end. And then they gave the second group the same problem, but distracted them and said, okay, we want, we're going to give you this problem. And, oh, by the way, here's what we want you to do a number ordering sequence, and we wanted to put these numbers in order. And so you had to focus on that the whole time because by the time you were done with it, you gave that answer, and then they go, okay, well, what's the answer to the other, th the other problem that we gave you up front? The answers that the people gave that were distracted the whole time were better than the answers that the people who were focusing on it the whole time gave because the subconscious process was better at solving the problem than the conscious process was. And it gave more intelligent answers based on the subconscious processing going on. And they could watch in the brain to make sure both areas of the brain were, were firing. So when you were doing the numbers sequencing problem, your brain was definitely firing there, you were definitely doing that work at a conscious level, but your unconscious brain was also working on the original problem they gave you. So it was definitely working the same area that they saw up here with this person who was in the conscious awareness, and that's where their brain was working. The same area was working down here as well, but the answers were better when the subconscious itself wasn't interrupted by your dumb you at the top level, okay? Now, when you're able to stop your regular conscious processing patterns and change them, this is the whole ball game, kids. This is the whole ball game to getting deeper into understanding a lot more about the universe and a lot more about your true self and the true nature of your existence. Because there is a point where you get down to the point of two cells. Two cells can get together and build a whole another human body, including the most complex brain in the universe, the, whole, the whole, most complex tool in the universe, your human brain, from two cells. Okay? Imagine the intelligence level that exists and the wisdom that exists there. By the way, these cells have never touched death, by the way. These cells have existed with life force since the moment that life began, whenever it began. There's been a continued stream of life consciousness. But these two cells down here that's going to come together to create a whole human body, they have never tasted death. And genetic memory has been proven, so our memories could go back multiple generations, potentially to the beginning of time. Who knows? And there's consciousness there. There's a high level of intelligence there. The deeper you go back into your mind and into your subconscious, the smarter you get. And the more um, functions that you can unlock that you didn't know that you had access to previously. And that's what changing your, your patterns are all about in mind hacking happiness. You get in there, you shut off a lot of the bullshit that you don't necessarily need, the unconscious processing that is working on a humanity 2.0 level, not a humanity 3.0 level, and you start to gain access to some amazing things. Here's a picture I wanted to show you to close this episode. This is me in the middle course with um, two amazing individuals, two of my favorite people on the planet. The guy on the right is uh, Dr. Bruce Damer, and Bruce regularly uses subconscious processing and altered states of consciousness where he enters his um, deeper levels of mind to do thought experiments, kind of like Einstein did back in his day. And Bruce follows um, the science wherever it leads in his lower levels of subconscious and he listens through this altered state of consciousness to what his subconscious layers tell him to do on science now the last time that he did this he got a really crazy idea and the layers of consciousness below his waking consciousness said do this xyz science he went and did that science created rna out of nothing but heat and wave motion and energy and tidal pools of the Galapagos Islands. You got the cover of Scientific American for being the first human being on the planet to create RNA from nothing but chemicals and heat and motion energy of uh, wave energy, that type of thing. And he's also recently proved that we're not, we didn't start as singular celled structures, but we start as multi multi celled structures, which uh, is going to blow the minds of the world scientists. It rewrites how history says we came to be on this planet. So this guy uses his lower levels of consciousness to inform his science when he goes and does that science and then is potentially up for a Nobel Prize at this point. And the guy on the left is Paul Stamets, 
Now, Paul is one of the world's leading my mycologists. He's probably the world's single leading expert on psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, he's a fan of, by the way. Um, but he understands the intelligence within cellular structures of uh, mushrooms and all the benefits that they can do. He is single-handedly saving the world's bee populations because of um, observations that he makes. And he often asks himself um, in altered states of consciousness, what's the science that I need to do? Listens to those thoughts, gets up, does the science, and then makes world-changing discoveries based on his altered states of consciousness, digging down deeper into mind beyond his regular brain patterns that exist at the upper layer of his consciousness, right? His regular waking awareness. We change those patterns, and then other patterns arise, and they improve our lives. This guy, amazing. He is doing, um, he noticed a the bear scratched this uh, uh, tree, this particular tree, and the bear walking around on the mycelium mat um, re lifts spores up onto the tree. This special mushroom then grows out of the scratch that the bear put in the bark of the tree. The bees love this thing. Well, it turns out that mushroom helps cure the bees of their small wing virus and this other virus that's 100% of the bee populations on the planet have it now. Well, this stuff in this mushroom kills that stuff. So now he's created a food for mush or for bees that include these mushroom drops. And he also designed a bee feeding apparatus that doesn't feed the yellow jackets and the wasps that only feeds the honeybees because of the special maze that he created in the, um, the, the drip designer for the, for the, uh, sugar water and only feeds the honeybees, gives them the mycelial uh, medicine that cures their virus and he's reversing um, colony collapse for bees because he accesses these differing levels of consciousness that then are you know more intelligent obviously than we are but then give him the answers to do the world changing science and then he comes out and does world changing science and he may single handedly s save the bees and the um, the food chain because we need bees to pollinate food for us or we die. Like mass starvation if the bees die. Humans die when bees go away. And he's single-handedly helping save the bees by accessing alternative states of consciousness based on changing the regular patterns within his mind that are usually going on. So this is the kind of stuff that we're gonna be hopefully talking about. I'm going to hopefully have both these guys as guests in the near future. Uh, but this is the kind of cool stuff, the cutting edge stuff that you're going to be accessing uh, within your own mind. Because we are going to get you to the point where you will be able to take control of your mind and change what it's doing. And change your brain's regular patterns of activity to where alternate patterns of activity arise. And it's going to blow your friggin' existence away. It's going to it's going to amaze you at how I want to say blow your mind. It's going to amaze you at how life changing that will be for you. And you will understand how it's not cliche to say going from humanity 2.0 to humanity 3.0 because you won't recognize your old self. Period. Period. You just won't. Anyway, sorry for the length of today's episode, but I thought we had a fun little romp, right? 50,000 foot view into how your mind works and how your emotions work, which no one has ever told you before because I helped put the whole model together. You're not going to get this stuff anywhere else than here, folks. We're going to talk about some next level shit. I promise you that. I hope things are well for you. Don't forget that if you want to support our podcast, support our sponsors because they pay us when you pay them. Uh, go to audible.com uh, or go to uh, mindhackinghappiness.com slash audible if you want to get a free book or my free book if you want to understand this stuff soup to nuts with a whole bunch of cool little stories and tidbits and uh, I'm told I read I read the book very well um, go to uh, mindhackinghappiness.com slash audible or if you want to check out the Muse headband to start a meditation session a meditation discipline um i highly recommend that as well because all the stuff that we're going to talk about here is going to be independent of and additive to meditation so uh, if you want to have visual feedback and auto audio feedback of how well your meditations are going check out muse mindhackinghappiness.com slash muse i hope this message finds you well and hope you guys have a great rest of your day talk to you soon Gunga, gunga, gunga.